so Harry, as I was saying, Steve Stanfield had this whole this little Zoom meeting in front that he shared on Cartoon Research where he was sharing the progress of his King Little King set. And I and he was talking about how he'd love to do his scrappy set. And I'm like, you've got to get Harry McCracken <laughs> and Paul Echeverry to do the to do the writings for it. Everything's got to be done by them. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, Steve is a real uh, along with everything else he knows. He's a, a real champion of scrappy, and I've always enjoyed um, the stuff he's done on Cartoon Research. And um, I'm grateful that he usually says nice things about Scrappy Land. There, I um, I must ask though. I know that. I imagine that the origins of Scrappy Land come from that article you wrote with Paul Treveri. Uh That was Will Friedwald who uh, oh. wrote that wrote that article. Uh, that was uh, we were talking about Animania. That that was an Animania in uh, the early uh, '80s. Um, I, I think probably of Mice and Magic was the first time um, I learned about Scrappy at all. I, I can still remember where I was when I, I bought my copy yeah. of Mice and Magic, which then... which I think. Leonard Malton was a little critical on a lot of stuff, which I know Jerry didn't always agree with Leonard on everything he says, because I know Jerry's a big TV cartoon fan and all that. But the more you watch those Columbia cartoons, you really enjoy them, but you also like, eh, he's kind of, he's <laughs> kind of right. That's a good way of describing he's, he's it. He's right, yeah. Uh, I, and... I like those cartoons more than he does, but he's on the nose. And then, uh, so in Animania, Paul and uh, Will did this big two-part article on Scrappy, uh, which I read and enjoyed. And I, I can't, I mean, I can't actually remember why I decided to do Scrappy Land, except I, I, at some point I learned there there was a surprising amount of Scrappy merchandise, given that he was not on, on the same level as a Mickey Mouse or Popeye. And a lot of it was kind of cool. So I, I started to buy some of it on eBay. And I probably just decided it would be fun to share it. And it appealed to me that I could create a website on a topic that nobody else was was likely to create a website on and to have the definitive website on that topic. So I created Scrappy Land. And um, I, I actually, I've actually come up with, unlike Orin's thing, mine's going to be very opinionated on websites. I'm going to give my reviews. I did a list of my 10 favorite websites. Scrappy Land is in my top four. Oh, wow. Um, and then it, it occurred to me what well, Scrappy was mainly a black and white character. Why, why don't I make this website in black and white, which most people seem to like, although I occasionally hear from people who object to that. And um, even though Scrappy right. is, is kind of a specific character, um, there's kind of just an endless amount of stuff to discover. I think some people don't take it as fun. They, they would like to see these beautiful, colorful Scrappy products I write about, um, but I always convert them into black and white in Photoshop. Yeah. And uh, the other cool thing is because there's only one Scrappy website, if you Google for Scrappy, you will come to it quickly. And so well, you know, if you Google I, Scrappy, the first thing you come up with is the Scooby Doo character. I was trying not to mention that. Uh, <laughs> but, but other than that, you will find my, my website and you know, relatives of people who work for Mints have found it. And um, people who have interesting Scrappy products have found it. People occasionally send me Scrappy merchandise for free just because, because they're nice. Um, how much scrappy good, stuff good. do you think you have? I'm just curious. I mean, I have dozens of items, a lot of which were pretty cheap, a, a few of which I paid a, a fair amount for. Um, I think I may be coming close to um, having everything, but there, there are a few items I, I know that exist that I don't have. There, were, there, was this great, I have, there were several scrappy dolls and I have some of them, but there was this, this great one who was actually fairly a, a pretty decent rendition of Scrappy in three dimensions wearing a striped shirt. Um, I don't have that one. Um, there's this guy, Mel Burncrant. Are, are you friends with him on Facebook? I'm friends with uh, Mel. I've, uh, I've gone through many talking back and forth yes. with him. I'm, I'm friends with him off Facebook too. So uh, Mel has an astounding collection of, of cartoon memorabilia and he is, he is most famous for his Mickey Mouse stuff, but he has a lot of Scrappy products and he has a stall that has, evaded me so far. And I also recently found a, a photograph of um, a scrappy model airplane, which I have never actually seen at all. And th those are the two things that leap to mind I don't have. And you know, there, um, there, there's not a lot of um, Columbia original art out there. I, I actually yeah. do have, I have a surprisingly large collection of art giving that for the most part, it doesn't exist. And I, I've never seen it, any scrappy cells for sale, but I, I have a few drawings from the studio and a, a couple of pieces of merchandise art. Um, I have a question, though, I must ask. I have always been curious about this. I, I probably should have just searched on your website, but 
those those photos of the three students with yes. graphene. Those are probably probably the most pop most copied photos from your website, I would guess. <laughs> Like the most copied and pasted on anywhere else on the internet. I think those are the uh, ones. probably. Although I, I may have copied and pasted them, some of them from some other site too. But yes, so those are pretty cool. Um, why? Well, where did those come from? Were those just like Columbia? Uh, well, Columbia, even though they did not do a, a great job of making great cartoons, ex except for maybe the, the earliest Scrappies, where Dick Humor was still working on them, they did do a really good job of, of promoting Scrappy and, and doing the merchandise. And they, they had this thing called the Scrappy Merchandise Department, which was in New York in the same building as the Van Buren studio across the street from the Fleischer studio. And they, they did a great job of cross-promoting um, their cartoons with their live action stars so that they did all these photo shoots with the Three Stooges and Scrappy Merchandise. And there, they had a number of child stars like, like Cora Sue Collins, who, mm. who is still with us, and Edith Fellows. Mm -hmm. and they, would get, they, would, they would take photographs of, of Edith and Cora Sue playing with Scrappy Merchandise. And I run a number of those photographs on my site too. But, but of course, the, the Three Stooges are the Columbia Three Stooges are basically so people, child actors. People, yes, the people remember. So th those get more attention. But, but every so often, um, I'm still finding these publicity photos. And I think Jerry has told me that there's at least I mean, one that he, has, he knows about that I don't have yet. And occasionally they pop up on eBay. I mean, some Columbia characters were better in merchandise. <laughs> my, my question was, is at least on the Charles Mintz years, because it seems like the later Columbia years and even still later UPA uh, were merchandise better. But in the Charles Mintz year, was Scrappy the only thing merchandise or was there other stuff that's even... I mean, rare, Crazy rare? Cat was its own thing, which... Yeah, I mean, they had this issue. They did not own Crazy Cat. Uh, yeah. so they, they probably didn't really particularly care about I, merchandise and crazy cat there were, there were a few things so i, I have I, a crazy cat question for you mm -hmm. so i'm watching all these cartoons in order and meanwhile i'm reading harriman's strip right and i'm like this is such a one <laughs> it's a really wonderful strip right it's the greatest one of the greatest if not if it's if it's not crazy cat it's pogo or peanuts or popeye um but um but yeah if it's not one of them but and i'm like why do I still like these, even though, in comparison, they're so bad? Yes, I mean we should hate them because, it, with the one exception of Little Angel, um, yeah, they did nothing to be faithful to this wonderful work. Um, I mean, I think that 1930s um, rubber hose animation is just kind of fun, um, yeah. even, even though it's not that great. I mean, I, I will happily sit down and watch an Oswald cartoon or um, most Van Buren cartoons, and. Um, I, I yeah, think like, I think the maybe the first couple of years of Scrappies actually are not bad, but uh, and even later, some of them are, are not bad. Uh, but it did it devolve pretty quickly. But 1930s animation is just sort of entertaining, even even but, with Crazy Cat. Who I, I think Crazy Cat is pretty clearly inferior to Scrappy. But I, I, I oh, definitely, those. definitely, because I'm watching these, and I'm even the later Scrappies, like the Crazy Cats just go down so downhill where Crazy is only in like the first five seconds of them. Right. <laughs> which I like, yeah. which he's like, even like, I think this one where he's just on the title card. Yes. Uh, just that, that, whole... that happened to Scrappy too. Like, you know, you know, a series is running out of steam when characters barely appear in their own cartoons. Right. And I know the Scrappy, they use the parrot a lot. P.D. Parrot. Uh, there was yeah. a character named Brat. Um, they did a co couple of color rhapsodies with, with Scrappy. Right. And, and at the end, he was just sort of like a, a generic little yeah, they boy. Did the, they did the one where he's, um, where, the holiday one where they go through the holiday, right, holiday land. Um, there, there are a couple of Columbia cartoons where I, I think people to this day argue whether this little boy is Scrappy or is just a little boy who looks sort of like Scrappy. <laughs> yeah, but then there's also the one where they go through like the calendar and it's um, his brother. Oopie, which also known his as brother Bonsie. and sometimes, yeah, that's, that's where like the contingency thing comes along too. Like sometimes <laughs> if it's his brother, sometimes it's not. And I think though, like half the reason, like I've always thought Crazy Cat was a girl, but then they just randomly, like you know what? Because like even in the very early, the very early Winkler, when they was still called the Winkler Studio, you got some consistency to where it was in a girl, and half the reason is because of that bow on his neck, right? And then so randomly, he just becomes more and more masculine. And by the time Mince took over, he's just like. He's got a girlfriend. He's got, I'm like, 
What the hell happened? There and then just to confuse matters more, um, I own the original art for the, this pin. They there was like a series of pins with all these characters in the 30s that I think were given out at movie theaters, and they did all the men's characters. Uh, one of whom is Crazy Cat's girlfriend, Kitty Cat. But she has dog ears, which is totally confusing. I'm not, I'm not clear on whether she was a dog named Kitty Cat or a cat with floppy ears. Yeah, this, there's a lot of questions to be asked about the men's cartoons. No, Camden, this question is for you because I have it back there, up there, but I haven't read it yet. I have a Harriman book that's about this thing, and I have not read it. Do you have that book? Um, the I have not no the book on Harriman by um Michael Tizer. Don't make it out if you guys talk amongst yourselves. It's called like crazy. Yes, yeah, crazy. yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a wonderful book. They talk about the cartoons in that. I have not read the book. I yet. have only read. I have don't have it, but I checked it out for my library. It does count cock it, but it talks the exact same thing that Malton talks about about the story behind Little Angel, which yes. it also does talk about. Harriman hated them. Yes, <laughs> I know that. I know that. Slago and Seagar also hated their cartoons, which I love Popeye cartoons, and I've argued time and time again with people, and apparently there's this, like, with some obsessed Fleischer fans, there's some deep hated, deep, deep tortured hatred with Seagar. I don't understand why, but they just don't like anything that's not an animated cartoon. The idea of having to read Popeye in the newspaper doesn't seem right to them. There is some there's some hatred with the Batman TV show that people have with comic books too. They love the Batman TV show, but they seem to hate comic books, which I don't get either. But I wonder how many print cartoonists ever really lo loved animation based on their work, other than Charles Schultz probably enjoyed the, the stuff he was actively involved Charles in. Charles Schultz, yeah. Uh, but but Walt Kelly hated Chuck Jones Pogo Special, even though he worked on it. Yeah. The, uh, the only thing I wrote two articles on Pogo Special. The only reason why the the, the, the designated two articles is it's a horrible, horrible thing, but it's got a cute story behind it, right? And Walt Kelly seemed to be fine with the cute story behind it, like the idea of a family worth that he seemed to be fine with it. But then it was all changed, right? And he actually seemed fine with Chuck's grandson being involved. He was fine with that too. And Chuck's grandson, the very first thing he tells me is this, it wasn't a great special. He fully agreed. <laughs> I have a good um, story about the Pogo special birthday special, which Maurice Noble told me, and you pro probably only heard it if you, and I probably told it on Facebook half a dozen times, but um, Maurice was working at the Chuck Jones studio when, when they were working on the Pogo special. He, he was working on something else, um, but he would go in every day and, and Walt Kelly would be there. And um, as you probably know, um, they, they promoted the special by doing this deal with some soap company for these little uh, figures of all the, all the Pogo characters and also cups, which I'm just old enough that when, when I was a, a very small child, my, my mother got all of those for us. And um, Walt Kelly worked on, on the figures. And um, one day when Maurice was at the studio, this big box arrived for Walt. And it was the, um, the figures, which they shipped to him after they made them based on his sculptures. And he opened up the box and took out Pogo and like looked at it with a, a look of total disgust and flung it across the room. And uh, Maurice walked over and, and picked it up and took it home. And uh, when I knew Maurice, he had this pogo in his kitchen you know, on a shelf with other knickknacks. And uh, Maurice told me the story and uh, said to me, would you like to have this pogo? And I said, yes, of course, I'd love to have it. And then I could see Maurice kind of hesitating and I could tell he, he regretted offering to give it to me. And so I, I gracefully let him um, take it back, um, which kind of in a way meant more to me than actually having it. And uh, I do sort of hope that it, it ended up with somebody who knew that story rather than it, it being disposed of or, or given away uh, when Maurice was no longer around. Did because... he not like the design of it or how it turned out? I, or... um, my sense is that whenever anybody created like three-dimensional versions of Pogo characters, they were they were not up to Walt Kelly's standards because um, there were also which, some uh, some other ones which also weren't that great. I, I find the, the little uh, soap figure ones that I can see my churchy from where I'm sitting, and um, I don't hate them, but I can understand right. why if, if 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 you're Walt Kelly, yeah. you you might have extremely high standards. <laughs> right, and um, 
that strip, that strip, I remember, here's a little fact for you. I said this elsewhere. Obviously, Dilbert's in the news recently. The very first way I learned about both of those strips is I was reading something about comics. And, you know, I, I Mark, just like you, I would even look in encyclopedias and see comic books. And there were two things in encyclopedia, Pogo, there was a Pogo strip and there was a Dilbert strip. And it was on the exact same page. And I was like, maybe I'll understand with these when, when I'm older. Well, come back 20, 20 um, we'll come back 15, 16 years later. I don't always understand everything involved in Pogo, but thank God for... I'm going to tell you right now, I really already miss R.C. Harvey's Swamp Talks in these books. Oh, yeah. I love these books. Um, which now it's one of my favorite strips, but Dilbert, oh my God, I hate it. I hated it before it was cool, but oh well. Well, I mean, like I said with uh, Jerry Beck, you know, Dilbert was a uh, kind of lightning in a bottle at the time when it came out. It was in the 90s when he worked for AT&T. I had a crummy desk job at the time. Uh, so anybody that had a crummy desk job, it was like gold. But then what happened is like, all of us, we get out of these crummy jobs, at least try to. And so did he. And so the humor went away because he didn't have anything to write about anymore. So that's my take on it. Anyway. Pogo has an infinite amount of depth. And um, I think you can kind of just come back to it as long as you yeah. live and, and find new things in it's, that. Which it's is kind of really sad that the first time I saw both of them were on the same page as each other next to each other. I'd like um, to know where that was because I mean that's kind of an odd comparison. You know, it's like even then it was just no. It was just, I literally think they just took two random strips out of the pile. I I, I honestly think that's the reason why. Because I mean, when, what year was it? You know, I don't know. I was just looking when for did a you book. See it? What year did you see it? I'll put it that way. Sounds like it would have been probably sometime in the eighties. Yeah, well, actually, well, Dibbler is the late well, eighties. Well, so that maybe was the, definitely maybe not the, maybe the time I saw maybe, it. Maybe the nineties. Yeah. Okay. That was so definitely not the time 90s. I saw it either. Okay, let's say it's the 90s, and, um, you know, Pogo has been out of print for almost 20 years. I mean, they've had various compilations other than... But, I mean, Pogo's a yeah, legacy but, I mean, strip. it's like, it's it's just kind of an odd, you know, like... like uh, Pogo's let, a let legacy show, let's, show, like let, let's show the yellow kid, and let's show Drabble, you know? It's like, <laughs> you know, like I don't know. It's like, <laughs> you know, I mean... You know, it was, it just sounds as bizarre as that. You know, it's like, it's something that's really old. Well, I mean, yeah, I can't, I know you like Pogo more than me, but it's like, it, Pogo is not something, I mean, they tried to bring it back a couple of times. It just doesn't work. Pogo only works, though, I don't understand half of what they say in Pogo, but Pogo only works, I think, to make you really appreciate it. If you, I don't know, have you bought the Fanographic books, Harry? Yes. Yeah, um, Pogo really only worked for someone my age. If you really have that depth, really good writing, if you really need, if you need it from R.C. Harvey and all those Swamp Talks and all that, to really understand the depth of it and really grasp it, I think that's the way you really need to first read it. Yeah, I mean, Walt Kelly was like was like the James yeah. Joyce of cartooning, and that. But, uh, but I mean, like, uh, even ten years later, the references will be gone after those strips were debuted. Yeah. And in some cases, Kelly was making references that even back then would have been hard to tease out. Yeah, so. which which that's why I really appreciated them because I understand as someone who is a history major, I understand, like you know, simple J. Mc, Mc, Malarkey. I understood immediately that's McCarthy, and I knew I knew a lot about McCarthy from like you know, from um, what's the Blacklist animation book? Um, oh, Harvey Dierenhoff's book. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, no, not not Harvey Dierenhoff's oh. book. Um, dang. What are you talking about? <laughs> the Blacklist, uh, the Cold War animation book. I know that book. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know if I know that book. No. I don't know. He's he's the CIFA San Francisco guy, I think. Carl Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Oh, Carl okay. Cohen's book. Oh, okay. I feel really bad now because he really is really helpful. I the reason one of the reasons that that Amber he was invited to Amber's documentary premiere too, and he showed up too. Carl is a legend out here. Yeah. Um. He. Um. Yes. Thank you. 
that's like books like that are like the way I know a lot about McCarthy so I immediately got that I immediately got that and like you know you know you've seen so many documentaries on the McCarthy hearings in school or whatever like that so sometimes things would grasp by but then you'd have references or like the I go pogo I know enough to wear like the the I like I and all that stickers all were big so I got that but there's just so many references that you don't get. So having that in the back of the book, you're like, man, I love this. So this book, Animated Propaganda During the Cold War, that one? Yeah. So like, okay. All right. I know that book. Yeah. <laughs> this is a roundabout way of getting there. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, that was, I went all over the place there. <laughs> and I know Carl, too. I, I used to, well, it was, Harry knows, it, uh, or may, may or may not remember. Yeah, I used to live in the Bay Area, so. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'm in Oregon here. What's going on here? <laughs> what yeah. part of Oregon are you in again, Mark? What? Are you in Portland? Or? I am in uh, Springfield. Oh. So I, city, I, so, yeah. I grew up in Portland, so I'm okay. considering myself to still to be an Oregonian. Y'all are back oh, in that. Know, I, I would never guess because I mean, you're mentioning Boston. You're mentioning well, I was hey. born in Boston, and then we moved to Portland. And then my parents decided they liked Boston Mark, better. Mark, oh, I got yeah. a spring. I got a. I got an Oregon question. Yes. Is it true that they have some kind of weird, weird, um, weird monarchy statue to Matt Groening in, in Springfield, Oregon? That it's just like the most public domain statue you can possibly have of the Simpsons. Characters? I have not seen it yet. I mean, they do have this. Okay, so this is legit. Um, so they have a, a mural painting on one wall that was dedicated, and Matt Groening actually showed up. This was done about a decade ago or something. It's where he reveals that the Springfield of the Simpsons is Springfield, Oregon. Well, he grew up in Oregon. It's I always thought, well, duh, you know. But he wanted to keep it kind of whatever mystery. It's still mystery. kind of a mystery. He's 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 pushed back on that. He's well, it. it's it's on record. He was videotaped. Yeah. Was he a politician? Yeah. Anyway, um, so they did this mural. They did this dedication. Yardley Smith showed up. There's little footprints, just like Grauman's Chinese Theater, or whatever. And uh, then, since that time, every Tom, Dick, and Harry store has like their own version of the Simpsons painting on their thing, from the <laughs> from the tire shop to the weed shop to the any shop. Yeah, it's like you know, and, and then on the freeway, you'll just see random mural of like Homer waving or something, <laughs> and three eyed fish somewhere else, and you know. Uh, like I, I went to Chester, oh, Illinois, which has oh, a lot of Popeye stuff. So I, I am I very, I, am, I think I'm very folks. good friends with the people over there. They're very nice folks over there. Yeah. I uh, went to Metro Metropolis, Illinois, which has. I, I've been there special. too. Uh, I went. I went on a round trip there, and I gotta say though, the Popeye Museum was much better than the Metropolis because for a museum on Superman, there I saw one comic book on display in the whole museum. Yeah, it was. It was less a museum and more somebody's unbelievably large Superman collection. Is that the museum that the head of Superman got? Yeah, oh, that's the museum. Okay. But, and I'm like, <laughs> and, but then the Popeye Museum, you know, it's more of a Popeye collection, but the people there are just so charming. And it's like this mom and pop thing. They do other things, but then they have the statues. They have all the funding, which they're revealing the last statues pretty soon. The well, last statue yeah, of Oscar, by the way. Oh. Going, going back to Simpsons a second. So the only other thing, there's no statues that I know of. But in the shop that's right behind, is like an art studio. They have a three-dimensional full-size Simpsons couch with the Simpsons on it and a seat that you can sit next to. Them. So oh. that's that's oh. that's available. But yeah, there's no Matt Groening. Uh, I, I heard the, the story. The real story. or imagined. So it's like that. I heard this story that there was some statue of like Homer's hand that they couldn't get the rights to a statue, but they have a giant statue in like some Portland or some well, Springfield Museum of Homer's hand just holding a donut because they couldn't get the licensing to We'd do anything. We'd be more else. likely to have our own bullwinkle statue. <laughs> what? We'd be more likely to have our own bullwinkle statue <laughs> than that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I have a, a Portland story you might enjoy. Oh, actually, two things, one of which is um, Krusty is based on Rusty Nails, the, this TV clown who I watched avidly when I was growing up, although there was this other guy, Ram Ramblin' Rod, who was not a, a clown, but has um, always struck me as being even more like Krusty. And if I ever meet Matt Graney, I'll ask him whether Krusty was really based on Ramblin' Rod. 
Uh, but my other story was in, in 1973, I think, um, my father taught at Reed College in Portland, and he learned there was this going to be this special guest appearance um, by Abe Levitao, who this is probably the first time you'd ever heard of Le Abe Levitao, but the, this great animator with Chuck Jones unit. And uh, Abe came to the campus and spoke, and my father took me, and Abe showed this incredible selection of, of cartoons and not just ones he worked on. He did show a bunch of Chuck Jones ones, but he, he also showed uh, Red Hot Riding Hood and some other Avery's and probably other things. And this was 1973. So this was kind of kind of before the, um, uh, we really knew about all these cartoons, except if he had seen them on the Bugs Bunny show. And it was it was kind of like a remarkable experience for me as, as a nine year old. And my father thought it was incredible and um, has stuck with me my entire life. And um, just recently, I, I learned that Abe's um, daughter, Judy, is on Facebook. I, I'm and, friends with his daughter, Judy. And I was writing about this incredible experience. And, and she um, pinged me and explained that that she was a Reed student at the time. And her father, Abe, was coming to visit her on campus. And they kind of got the idea that as long as he was there, why doesn't he show some cartoons? <laughs> um, and so Judy was at this event I, I went to uh, 50 years ago and probably remembers it better than I do because she, she was older. But it, it was really kind of a, a um, transformational experience for me as a cartoon fan. I did this article with Judy about different stuff in the Levito collection on cartoon research. And I originally wanted the Academy to do it. So the Academy wouldn't let me use anything, which That's seems bad. unfair when I'm doing it with her daughter, right? His daughter. And, uh, and but, Abe um, kind of died so young. He, he died before he was able to get full appreciation for all the stuff. While researching, I did come across like all the interviews available with Labe Lovato were all about off to see the wizard. <laughs> So all so my article about Off to See the Wither actually revolves around four different print interviews with Abe Levito about the special. Because wow. he was really the master. There was no Chuck Jones interviews available about that special. It was entirely I don't even think Chuck's name is really on it. Like the, the Chuck Jones feel I asked them, they have nothing. They said that that was entirely Abe Levito's thing. Linda Jones told me that was entirely Abe Levitos. Chuck had nothing to do with it. That makes sense. Because um, he said that that was Abe's thing. Abe had a little department with Abe but did that. So um, so I think Chuck was later with the producer because I think Chuck owned the studio. So that's kind of like Hannah and Barbera or Jay Ward. But, but um, so somewhere is there is a no longer surviving radio interview of Abe Levito talking about animation because one of the articles I wrote had this long thing and it says on, I'm making up a random station, I don't know, it's KTTP, let's just randomly name that as a station, saying that last night he was on so-and-so talking about animation with, um, Person, I don't know the name of either, but, there, but there's a school named after him. Um, Bob Jones. All right. Bob Jones, yes. Thank you. But that's why I didn't know, because I was saying Bob Jones. I'm like, no, that can't be right. But um, most basic name in the history of America. But he interviewed Abe Levito on the air by animation. And they just, you know, and it's like Cincinnati. Nobody's there for animation, so... He was there, they interviewed him, and it was about, and that was part of the interview. I imagine this interview no longer exists. Let's just put that out there. It definitely probably does not. It's from the radio. It was printed in Appetunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was printed in Appetunes, that's right. <laughs> It would have been nice we don't to know. Harry might, not, might, just reveal, might just not reveal it. Right, right. If I knew it was there, I wouldn't be able to tell you anyway. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, there was the, some some at some point they interviewed him, and snippets of that interview is on, but how the animation process work is on the article I wrote. Somebody has it. Sometimes the weirdest things pop up in a random. Yeah. Thing, so yeah, I I said that um, I told I jokingly told someone 
that this is gonna that if they find that Popeye and Betty Boop stag reel, they just need to go. Steve just needs to go all out with that thing and just make the most racy thing you can pop. Like you got you got to go for those proposals of that Magoo X rated film that Backus wrote about. You just got to go all out the strangest thing you could possibly put out. There's a pretty long list of stuff I would would love to turn up. Uh, when, when when I was working on this Bullwinkle statue article, I learned that. Um, Helen O'Connell, who had this hmm. show about Hollywood, did did two episodes yeah, on, uh, those on the Jay Ward I? studio. Yeah, yeah. June was on one, and then she also did one around the time of the um, statue unveiling. And um, some other episodes of her show are on YouTube, so it doesn't seem completely unthinkable that these mm -hmm. might survive somewhere. Uh, supposedly, yeah. Jay Ward also shot film of, of the statue unveiling with Jane Mansfield. Uh, I yeah. haven't seen that, but I'm, I'm hoping maybe it'll show up. Dave, no, Harry, I have to ask you a quick question. Have you ever thought about writing a book on Scrappy? I've toyed with that. Um, I mean, the, the challenge is, and actually I, I pitched one once. Of course, the, the challenge is that there are not a huge number of people out there who know that they love Scrappy. Although I found that once people see all the merchandise and stuff, often they find it to be fascinating. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to like sell the idea to some big publisher, but- um, Like, couldn't you sell it to like Bear Manor Media? Conceivably, or I mean, I, I've also toyed with the idea of of self publishing something, which is is totally doable these days. So, um, it certainly has been in the back of my mind. Um, I mean, the other the other challenge of Scrappy is Scrappy is owned by Columbia, which is owned by Sony, uh, and they did a pretty good job of renewing the copyrights. So there are not a lot of Scrappies but, in the public domain, as far as I know. So, but does but does Columbia know they own Scrappy? I don't think they do, although they also restored a lot of them. Um, I we actually. Jerry had this great screening based on Scrappy right. Land um, um, back about 15 years ago, where we had these beautiful prints of Scrappy cartoons, which which Michael Schlesinger. That's what I was about to say. But wouldn't that have been Michael Schlesinger and not Sony? Because I know Mr. Schlesinger is very aware of them. Yes, I imagine they they may have just re restored a lot of stuff, and maybe Michael put the Scrappies in the queue. But the, there are beautiful prints of them, including uh, one. Another big change from when I started Scrap Scrappy Land was in like. I started right before YouTube existed. And so it was pretty tough to, to see scrappy cartoons at all. And today almost all of them are on YouTube. I, yeah, look at me. I, I just I just I just watched almost all of the Columbia <laughs> cartoons in order because of I, YouTube. I, I took that article by Will and Paul and uh, embedded almost all the scrappy cartoons in there because they are mostly available today, which yeah, is only I know only that, a, um, a fairly recent all, development. The ones that aren't on YouTube, I know that my friend Strom Pats from um he goes to a lot of Tommy Stathis's shows. And um Tommy has shown a lot of the ones that are not on YouTube before. Uh, I do have maybe one that I have a copy of that is um not available. Yeah. And um The I Chinatown they, Mystery is one yes. that he's that he's shown that they've shown it cartoon. That is, that's probably the most offensive um uh, scrappy cartoon as you can kind of tell from the title and the, yeah that, that one i think was even not part of the 1950s syndication package because even by then um they wisely decided not to make yeah. it available yeah there is some there is some pretty racy columbia cartoons like i don't know i don't know how george harriman a person who really wanted to hide the idea the the, the fact that he was half black would feel about Crazy Cat doing an all-out minstrel show, and I don't know how someone who is half black would really have thought about that. Just the idea that George Herman was aware of these cartoons kind of makes me sad because they are so disrespectful, and I I don't even know if he got any money from them, given that um, I think they, I don't think he did. The money probably much. all went to King Features. Uh, unfortunately, I know that apparently someone told me that Otto Slago when he said the little king, which aren't as unfaithful. They are, actually. Yeah, they are. But they're somehow a little bit more faithful, which is hard to do. They make but, some attempt to capture his uh, character. Yeah, but um, he hated them. He called them like someone like the bastard. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with you, though, Charles. Was, and I love, but I love Popeye shorts, but and again, again, before we got off the air, um, I said that there's some deep hated hatred with some Fletcher fans for Seagar. Interesting. It, I can, that's weird to me, given that they're um, that the strips are brilliant, 
and the cartoons are also really good. And uh, even though the Fleischers did not right. really uh, yeah. adapted all that faithfully, I think they did. They did capture some of the spirit of these characters. But that's the thing, though. I, I, I Jules Pfeiffer said in an article that um, he never cared for the Fleischer cartoons because they were all Popeye versus Bluto, and that was not the essence of the strip. And I agree. And I love those cartoons, but I do agree with him. Yeah. It, that is the formula, but I, I do think, though, the best Popeye stuff ever made was from the strip. Without yes. a doubt, it was the strip. And I think the strip is easily my favorite comic strip. Yeah. Which, it's hard to deny that the strip wasn't a little, was I love, like, you can't put, you can put, I've shown Fleischer cartoons at a festival and besides Superman, Superman always gets a good reaction. Popeye meets Sinbad gets the best audience game. Every time. Um, I also show Minnie the Moocher because Minnie the Moocher, I guess, has gotten, become an internet meme. So that always gets a gap from my audience. Too. Um, I'm very fond of the cartoons, but Cigar is genius. Um, yeah. Well, without Cigar, you wouldn't have had the cartoons. So that ends that. You know, it's like you yeah. know, the same people against uh, the Superman comic book and Siegel and Schuster. <laughs> yeah. There are some people against um, which. I get that there's there's a lot of people who love the Batman TV show, but the very idea that you would just diss the entire Batman history before seems very strange for the fact that you wouldn't have Batman without the comic books. Right. Like, like the uh, <laughs> Mark, yeah. we've had Golden Age comics before. Don't say that you hate them. I don't hate them. Right. I like but them. <laughs> I thought you were doing this, but like, yeah. Oh, like to the to the naysayers eh, right who cares because you know, like what I'm you like, like and who cares about that because <laughs> you know? i'm like because i had this argument with someone on facebook and i'm like he's like well if it's not adam west it's not batman i'm like well there was a batman <laughs> before this. like okay adam like, west is my favorite batman but that's not batman I mean, mine too <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean i'll freely admit it's not batman but you know it's yeah like, my bat my favorite like batman, batman is the golden age batman but i like adam west just because in fact, I like, here's the honest question, the answer. I like Adam West Batman, the same reason I like the crazy, the, the Columbia crazy cat. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's like nothing wrong with like. It's nothing faithful to it, but I just character. like it. Um, oh, a couple of things I want to say, interrupting now. Um, Jerry Beck said this a few years back, I think at Stu Showstack show, about Sony and Columbia, that they went through and restored everything including trailers, including, you know, every short and everything, which is why you have that Three Stooges box set that you were watching on the Three Stooges in Christine. Yeah. Movie. They went through everything, even stuff they don't ever intend to release. So they probably even did the scrappy that's offensive, but, you know, it's like, you know, then it goes back on the shelf. But, you know, they did everything for him very back. So you can get more details from him how... <laughs> thorough that was but you know they said that they did trailers and everything you know every possible scrap yep. in their archives done you know? the materials are there should they uh, ever want to do a blu-ray set i actually want so they could but they just don't it reminds me of a story which is i actually as a tech journalist i once went to this event with the president of sony sony's u.s consumer electronics group and this is when sony was kind of challenged by samsung and all these other companies and uh he was talking about um, how things were going to be different from now on. And he said, we, we like to think of ourselves uh, with one word, and that word is Scrappy. And I sat there being aware that actually Sony owns a character named Scrappy and not volunteering that fact, because that would have been kind of a little bit nerdy. Um, but yeah, I don't think Sony really knows that it owns Scrappy. So I think if you put a book with Scrappy on the cover, I don't think you'd get in trouble. I, I I have sort of a little disclaimer on my website just in case, but books can books as you know can be a little bit trickier. Um, I've sort right, of thought, but, about, thought about maybe doing like a, a a magazine about Scrappy. You can put it on. You can put it in silhouette, like 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 <laughs> right. like Joe Joe Adamson did on the cover of. Texas or or, or it right. could be a guide to Scrappy collectibles, which I, I think mm -hmm. is a, maybe a little a little bit safer. Of my but, um, I know that Jerry Beck told me that anymore if you put a black and white scrappy picture in a book you would never get in trouble there's just no no one gets really in trouble for using an image in a book anymore 
Well, is it, answer me this, either of you, bro, probably Harry. Isn't Scrappy going the way of like the Steamboat Willie? Meaning it's it's a trademark, yeah. yes, but I mean, they're not even using it. I'm like, is it a trademark though? Is Scrappy a yeah. trademark? I'm not sure whether they re renewed the trademark and maybe so, I mean, th th theoretically. Domain. That's what I mean, theoretically, there's a hundred different cartoon characters named Scrappy. Right. Which um, unfortunately, I bet Harry is brought brother and brings up that to Harry about every five minutes. <laughs> there's also, I mean, there's a rapper named Scrappy, um, but there's also already a public domain version of Scrappy. Um, something I've, I've written about quite a bit on my site is that in the 30s, when when Will Eisner was just getting started and running a studio with Jerry Iger, they did a, a Scrappy newspaper strip, which they did not manage to sell to any papers in the U.S. Um, it did appear in in France and Australia and maybe some other countries. And then a few years later when they were doing um, Wonder Comics, which is mostly known because um, Wonder Man appeared in it, the, the first Superman ripoff who, who DC sued. Uh, one of the backup strips in Wonder Comics was um, they took all of these old scrappy strips they'd done a few years before and they retouched them um, like they gave uh, Scrappy had a, a cowlick in the strips. They, they took that off and gave him parted hair. Um, they did something similar to, to Margie, his, his little girlfriend. And um, and they renamed him from Scrappy to Shorty Shortcake. And then ap after they'd used up all of the strips they retouched, they continued doing new Shorty Shortcake stories, which are essentially Scrappy stories, except he's called Shorty. And, and I am reasonably confident that Shorty Shortcake is in the public domain. And if, it, if anybody feels like doing scrappy fanfic, they can just do Shorty fanfic. But I think it's also true that just- I, I'd like to know who in the world wants to write scrappy fanfic. <laughs> not, even, not, even, not even me wants to, but also I believe in a, in a few years, you will be able, to, be able to do them as long as they're based on the very early cartoons. Um, so you'll have to call Oopy Vonsi, which was his name at first, and and Scrappy will need to have like, like a like Vonsi? A, oh yeah, yeah. Scrappy will have to have like a basketball for a head, like he did in the early cartoons, and you, you won't be able to make him look like he did in the later ones. Yeah, that thing's head, that, that that kid's head is about is, is about bigger than his whole body. Vonsi is based on the Yiddish word for bed bug, and I think I think maybe uh, once uh, Columbia realized that they they changed the name to Oopy. I'm just curious, what was Harry Cohen's involvement in all this? Because Harry Cohen was known as like, you know, the evil, the evil miser of all. I don't know. I mean, I've always wondered whether there are any, there's any kind of like Columbia archive that's out there that might have any paperwork. Um, there's so little known about the behind the scenes stuff there. I mean, I did, I, I was good friends with Dick Humor's son, Richard Humor. And so a little of what I know, I know from that. And I do have the sense that, well, most animation fans think of, of Charles Mintz as being an ogre based on his relationship with Walt Disney. It seems like by, by the time he did uh, had his own studio, the people who worked for him kind of kind of liked him and he was he was not a horrible person to work for. So I have, I have a somewhat more favorable impression of, of Mintz than yeah. uh, a lot of people do based on that. Okay, uh, Camden, I, this is the book. I went back there and grabbed it. You have this one. Read this it's, one. It's a I fantastic book. I don't, but like on page, I think I, think I just on. checked it out from the library. So I think I even know the page. I think it's like 112. Oh, okay. Talk about that. it. <laughs> it's a fantastic biography of George Harriman, and which you would not, just... not expect to have a huge amount of stuff on the cartoons. No. We just go to the index and search and search yeah. like little. Anyway, angel, I should I read it, but I mean, I Although, have other things to read, so it's in the stack. Huh. Although I, I, I mean, I would, I would love a book about Crazy Cat that kind of did include the cartoons and the, the later TV cartoons, and I mean, didn't later uh, TV cartoons. I watched some of them. Didn't Dell randomly do like a, a few Crazy Cat comics? The one the, thing the I like the brand new, later TV cartoons is I kind of like the voice of the mouse. I really do like the voice of the. Mouse. So when I read the strip, I do imagine the voice of Ignatz, that exact voice. <laughs> Well, those King Painters cartoons are the first ones I ever saw. So it's like, for me, I, it's like, it, you know, when you see, you know, you've done this probably yourself, Ken, and it's like, or Harry, or, you know, where the version you see first kind of holds a soft spot with you that that's the version, even if it's not the original, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you think somebody would try to do some more faithful uh, Harriman? And what maybe did somebody do that for Sesame Street or something at some point? That's, no, that's, there's a Sesame Street thing that's actually really good. 
Right. And I'm someone who doesn't even care for sesame. That like is not like a Sesame Street obsessor. Like I know some people in my sphere sphere are, but um, <laughs> but which is really sad. The fact that I've written about <laughs> Sesame Street animation for my um for my um Curiosity Shop article. I, I think he utilized a lot of good animation studios. A lot of oh, yeah, he did. And they, it's interesting. You know, they, I like the Sesame Street uses Beetle Bailey. They use Superman. They use all this different stuff. And I'm like, it was kind of, those were all neat. Well, but then there was the one, there was Little Angel, which I think Little Angel is, is good, but I think it couldn't have been a better short if they would have given. I think graphically, I think it was as good as it could be. I think it, it. I think graphically, there's no way to affordably do that style. That's why I think Bill Littlejohn's Pogo project that he was going to do. I didn't the know plans that. of that w w looked really good, right? Hmm. When was that, what? was that? Was that before the Chuck Jones show or after? Um, Bill Littlejohn. No, there's a cartoon research. I might be mistaken the name, but there was. It was like the Pogo special. I don't know. There's a web. There's a. There's an art. There's a YouTube video. Of someone who did like like put it together and made like a pilot out of it. Oh. It's really good. I mean, Walt Kelly eventually did one on his own with his wife Selby, and um, yeah, Dis Disney in the nineteen fifties at least considered doing some kind of pogo feature, which actually sounds like a terrible idea based based on what yeah. Disney probably would have done with it. Yeah, that's that sounds like a horrible idea. But um, but pogo there is also that stop motion thing, right? But which is not very good either. But the Bill Littlejohn thing would have worked. Hmm. Problem is, I here's why I also I don't think that the only reason they did it is because they scrapped it. I think the only reason they did it also because you really can't make that style affordably. You can't make that style with limited animation. It's just no. not. Chuck Jones tried it with full animation. It failed. You kind of need an army of people who are as good at drawing Pogo as Walt Kelly was, and there there was only right. one person who was as good at drawing Pogo which, as Walt Kelly. Which was. I think is the like which my friend Ben Olson, who I brought on Mark's podcast, I brought him on, and he's done peanuts art for galleries and stuff. He does art for the Chuck Jones Gallery. Very nice guy. Brought him on twice, or maybe I think I brought him on like three times, right, Mark? At least twice, yeah. At least twice, but. Um, <laughs> He's a uh, um you know these things blend together now. He um he oh sorry he he told me that the hardest one of the hardest characters to draw is Charlie Brown. The, the character uh, the Schultz made it seem like he wasn't a good cartoonist, but he really was. Yeah, I mean the fewer lines, the harder it is to fake. Yeah. Even like people he had to, that assisted him, like Dale Hill and uh, Salzburg or Sals, what's it? Sals, I can't remember the guy's name. Jim Sasseville. Sasseville and, uh, that's what it is. There's uh, one you know, guy who did a lot of the iconic merchandising art, like like the, the famous Peanuts lunchbox. Yeah. With with Even all the characters was, was drawn by spot, drawn by somebody who specialized yeah. in it. Yeah. So I'm sure that kind of irked Charles Schultz sometimes. Yeah, that's like the why they just dis dismissed them after a while. You know, it's like you can't draw it exactly like me. <laughs> it felt like I know that the I when Lee Mendelson, Lee Mendelson is like the only animation producer that I like, only animate that that when you listen to his stories, you say, you know what, all of these seem believable. I don't think he stretched very much of this. Like Walter Lance, every story he said was made up. <laughs> Joe Barbera, that. half of that, and Chuck Jones, he complained that Bob Clampett made up such stories. Uh, by Mel, Mel Blanc. What? Mel Blanc. Chuck Jones made up his stories by the end of his life, too, though. Yeah. But Lee Middleton, all of his stories seem to connect. Everyone else has the exact same story. So it all played in really well. So when he tells that story that said, I refuse to do, he told the story in like an Emmy interview, which I really hate Emmy's interviews. But I'm listening to them while I was shelving and I'm like, I hate this. Because he has more stories to tell, but they shut him up when he's trying to tell a story. But he says, I don't want anyone to do it, but Bill Melendez, because he's the only one who can draw it right. I absolutely think that's true. There's no way that's not true. This just, just seems like something Schultz would say. Yeah. Well, he trusted him, I'll say that. Yeah. Was, you know, he, was, he allowed him to draw the little red-haired girl if you know, 
<laughs> which, 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 Bill, Bill and Melendez in the interview says that was a mistake. Yeah, but I he mean, he said the verbatim that that was a mistake. He still allowed him. To, <laughs> even if it yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, I certainly do not love all the peanut specials, but at least all the ones done while Schultz was around, you you knew that. Um, there were things that he was involved in think, and, and wanted to happen, which is not true of a lot of these things. I think the first 10 of them are the ones that hold, I think the, I think the people were complaining about Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and I'm like, let's be honest. It's not that the, that incredible special. <laughs> it's good. It's got great animation in it by Bill Littlejohn and Phil Roman with the chair sequence. They did that chair sequence. I think is really well done, but it's not the special that people remember it as. Well, I like it, but I do too. But I think it's like the last good really good peanut special. Again, first things you see. Um, my cutoff on peanuts is the uh, Arbor Day, and it's only because it's the last one with Vince Guaraldi music. It's just yeah, that's, that's totally fair. arbitrary. But I mean, it's like uh, the next one was like what a nightmare, and it's like yeah, it lives up to its title. What? <laughs> and I mean, I know a lot of people who cut off their peanuts after the first twenty years. I like the peanuts. I like, <laughs> what? Anyway, I like the <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I like peanuts to the entire end because Schultz was doing it. Yeah, I, I when towards the end, um, I did not love it when it was in the paper, and I remember um, after Schultz died, my my father saying, "I think." We kind of didn't appreciate what we had that he was still doing this. And I, I go up to the um, Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa all the time, where you can go into a gallery and read Peanuts uh, in the from his original strips. And I have to say, I, I have gained um, a greater appreciation for the later years because mm -hmm. he he never slept walked through it. He was still experimenting and trying new things, and uh, he got to have a very shaky hand. But he he even made that work for him. And he, right. even though, though these later strips. Are not laugh out loud funny like 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 the sixties or early seventies, um, and are not as character driven. I think you you still saw a mind at work, um, and there are so many comic strips where after a while you you don't see that. You see somebody going through the motions. I think that I always liked when I was a little younger. I liked Jim Davis as Garfield when I was younger, but then when I got older, I'm like, is it really that great? Because after a while, I got into the motion where I'm like, you know, he's not like like when you look at the earlier ones. Actually, I think it's a pretty neat strip, but then he's not even doing it anymore. Right. I've always felt like it's very rare for a comic strip to be at, at, at the top of its form for more than about 15 years. Um, I mean, as much as I love Pogo, even even the later Pogo, I do not love as much. And there's yeah. probably about about 15 years of Peanuts where it's at its peak, and. Um, so it's really hard to, to, to do it forever. And uh, I can understand why Bill Watterson chose not to do it um, because he um, he stopped doing it while he was still at his peak. I think like when I, on Peanuts, the peak years, usually most people agree with it, like 55 to 70. Just yeah. about, yeah. I would yeah. say the peak year in that is probably 1967, 68, probably right in that sweet spot. I would, yeah. yeah. But then like, I think that Schultz, I think that people criticize, like, you know, criticize the style, but I think that at a time they didn't know about Schultz's shaky hand and his, and his trouble drawing that became later. I think if people knew of those details, I think that they would not have been as critical. Well, I knew he had a shaky hand. It's, I, you could tell, you know, right. if he wasn't public about it, you could just tell. I kept reading it. Um, I was, uh, I was kind of bummed out when he went from four frames to three frames. But yeah. I get it. I get it why he did it because it's less to draw, and you know, and it's like he was having difficulties. He, I mean, I just recently on uh, Twitter I saw that the curator at the Schultz Museum said that um, for the longest time he was contractually required to do four panels because the the original idea with peanuts was that that newspapers could run it small or they could run it like in, in two tiers, yeah. and um, so he he only got out of that in the the late eighties, and and once right. he was able to do that, he did it. Yeah, um, I love. I love that experiment when, when, whenever you read, whenever Schultz, whenever you ever hear an interview with Schultz and they mention that it's named Phoenix, he, yes. like he, he always looks like he wants to strangle he whoever he's interviewing them. Yes, I just saw Dick Cavett's rerun the other night uh, where Schultz goes on and on about how it's the worst name he ever heard of for a comic strip. Yeah. I'm surprised that he never actually, you you would think that he could have told uh, the syndicate that e either we changed the name to good old Charlie Brown or, or I walk 
at some point, and he, he could have gotten away with that. And he and he can tell that you're really like the but peanuts, peanuts, and the very very top, and it's like starring good old <laughs> Charlie Brown. He's just like trying to hide it. But the, odd so that, part, the, the odd part is, you know, for not liking it, all of that. You know, for years he had the strips where he had the little pre uh, designated black peanuts square or right. up in the corner, and you know. Uh, the other thing is on the Sunday strips it would say Pe peanuts featuring good old Charlie Brown. Then later he cut the good old Charlie Brown and just had a peanuts on there. And I was like, well, for someone who doesn't like it, he certainly gave, gave in easily. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, the, uh, which, the name being in the little black um, bar was, I, I bet you that was part of the, of the space saving uh, technique where you didn't even need the room to have the name of the strip. Yeah. Up top. I wanted to mention, by the way, speaking of adaptations of comic strips, I, I actually think some of the recent Peanuts animation, like like the shows on Apple TV, are surprisingly good, and uh, maybe even better than some of the stuff done when Schultz was alive towards the end, and and really quite respectful of yeah. of the strip. And um, his widow, uh, Jean Schultz, I think has done a really good job of uh, of caring about the way that um, her husband's stuff is used and uh, holding it to a, a high standard. I was talking with Jason Whitton. Whitton about who wrote this who wrote a book on Mark Walker. I don't know if either of you have a even a Mark Walker conversation is another book called Talking Comics with Mark Walker. Oh, yeah. I you don't have, know about I've read it. Yeah. Um is it good? How good is it? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. But um but I was talking with him. We we've been collecting comics and I bought in fact I just bought the color because obviously I'm I'm twenty I'm twenty three years old. Give me a break. I I couldn't afford to buy all the comics when they came out because I was 13 when the when the last volume of Mickey Mouse came out that Gerstein did. Okay. Hey, so I <laughs> what? I said I didn't even buy them. <laughs> but so I bought the I color. Can't buy everything. I just bought the color Mickey Mouse's. We were talking back and forth because I haven't bought all the Peanuts volumes, so I got like 16 volumes left, right? So um, so we were talking. And we were saying, like, the, the good thing about the Mickey Peanuts, I'm like, any other comic strip, any other ones, whether it's, you know, Blondie, which they released two volumes of, or Mickey Mouse, which they, you can't even find volume 10 of anymore. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It's like, it's zero. Nilch. The, the strip will always be in print. They've reprinted it in paperback. They've reprinted it in the UK. They reprinted it in Australia. Like, they did totally different books in both of those countries. They've reprinted other languages. In 15 years, they're going to do it again. Yeah. I just bought. And it's going to sell again. I just bought these enormous books that are up for 30 bucks. I bought every Peanuts Daily from the start through um, the 1970s. Yeah, I guess. Didn't you have, did you have already the Fantagraphic books? I don't have all the Fantagraphics and the, these. I, uh, it's nice to have them. Like the best thing is to have all of the 50s in one book because you can see the you know how Snoopy evolved mm -hmm. from a, a tiny puppy. Who didn't do anything funny into the Snoopy we know, and you see Charlie Brown become Charlie the, Brown, and Lucy become one, Lucy. The one thing I don't like about those those Peanuts books, and I get why they did them, is I don't care for the Peanut the celebrity intros. Oh, and I, well, I, th I think those help sell them. So I'm yeah, I'm that's, only, that's, well, that's why them. I think they sell they sell well because if you notice which ones sell well, ironically, it's also based on which celebrity right there. Also, I, I, be I believe that um, Fantagraphics. I mean, that Fantagraphics has probably done really well with those books, and that's helped support all, all these great collections they do that probably don't make huge amounts of money. Right. Like, I got a story here for those intros. I sure. worked really hard to get one of those because. I, ha I met Charles Schultz, and I think I have a valid story to tell. And I've told it to Jeannie Schultz. I've told it to anybody who ever listens to it. Um, but <laughs> Gary Groth said, oh, yeah, we'll get you in there. Unless somebody more, and the one time, so I don't know which volume this is, but there's one time where he almost was like, I think I might get you for the next one, Mark. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. And then at the last minute, he says, sorry, somebody else more important. But, but wait, wait, wait. wait. And who was it? President Obama. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, ah! I met Charles yeah. Schultz too, so I want to do an intro as well. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Met him, I met him a few days after he announced his retirement. I, I drove up with a friend to uh, the skating rink, and we, we basically sat around until he was having breakfast with some friends, and we waited until he was done with his breakfast, and his friends were talking to somebody else. And as we left, we, we 
Thank Tim. Briefly. I um I was reading Jason Winton's in conversation with Mort Walker, and Mort Walker said in an interview the last time he spoke to talk Schultz was the day he retired. Oh. He was talking to them, and the entire time Walk, Schultz was crying and he hung up the phone and he could tell that this was the last day he'll talk to him. He just Speak. could sense the, the he could just sense it. When I met him, it was early 90s, so he was still vibrant enough. I mean, he, there's no plans of retirement. I don't think he even, remember that one time he had to do an operation in the 90s and he worked right. way ahead, like 20 weeks or something, so he could uh, recuperate. Yeah, but this is even before that, so. Now, Harry, I do have to ask you one question about your tech writing, by the way. Sure. Um, when did you become a tech writer? I be, well, um, I guess it depends on how you count. Um, I got into um, microcomputers, as we called them back then when I was in high school. And um, right, a, right after I graduated from high school, I wrote a, a couple of uh, reviews for this magazine uh, called Creative Computing, which was this re really great computer magazine in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and But that was also shortly thereafter, I started working at Animato and doing Appatunes, and I, I wrote movie reviews for a magazine called Cine Fantastique. So I, I did not do any more computer writing until um, the early 90s when um, I got a job at a computer magazine but based partially on the fact I'd been doing anim Animato, which I had just stopped doing. Um, and that was a magazine called Computer Buying World. And so um, that was um, 32 years ago, I can't quite believe, but that was, that was sort of when I started doing it full time. And what were you, what was your, was this, was like writing your job before though too? Uh, well, I grew up, uh, like a lot of cartoon fans, being interested in being a cartoonist and sort of a, over time that sort of evolved into being interested in magazines. I can, you know, comic books and, and magazines to me are just two slight variations on, on the same idea of sequences of words and images mm -hmm. and even websites are very similar. So I kind of, yeah. I began to love magazines um, as a reader, which led to being interested in, in writing for them. And uh, I was into computers and gadgets. And uh, this was during this period where there was a thriving industry of computer magazines. Um, and there was never a thriving industry of magazines about animation and comic strips. So that was, it was kind of pretty clear which opportunity I should try to pursue. I'm taking a periodical writing class. And um, I, and so my teacher described periodical writing as something written regularly on a scheduled basis. That's the definite periodical. So I raised my hand and like, is a comic strip or a comic book periodical? It's like, let me think about that. <laughs> Next class, it came out to be like, you know what? For your essay, you can write about a comic strip or a, com a comic book. I thought about it, it's periodical. They're certainly in periodicals and then on a periodical basis. Yeah, they're on a periodical basis and that's and they're written. So I actually agree with the idea that it can be a periodical. You can't say that Doonesbury is not opinionated periodical. All right, I'm gonna have to wrap this up. I mean, I hate, I hate to say it because, uh, you know, it's like we could talk for hours, but... Uh... This we should do fun. it again. Yeah. But we'll yeah. look at I mean... that. And, uh, so, um, I appreciate you, Harry, being on the show. and appreciate That's been a lot of fun. Um, I have another whole show of stuff for you, like meeting Bob Clampett and yeah. uh, Carl Barks way back when. So we can plan another one. We can plan another one right away. I just have to get a yeah. So anyway. Wonderful. I thank, yeah. thank you guys. And uh, I'll just wrap it up here and saying thank you again for another episode or being on another episode or watching another episode of Fun Ideas Podcast. And this is Mark Arnold. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>